Okay. Um, for me, the big question is is on page three, which is the first real page of this, and it's in the it's in the fourth paragraph, which starts with the quote where it says, "The United States did not want Allende to assume the presidency. My father was the only political obstacle for the military coup." Starting this project, well, I I thought the big question for me was why the U.S. cared if Allende came to power. And I think that that question sort of frames everything, and I. I start with this article, and I think this may be, there's lots of places you could start, but I start with this article because it really does lay out the key players, Kissinger, uh, Nixon, but also um, Kornblu, who is the guy who's been releasing these documents who maintains the National Security Archives. Um, and this article for me got me thinking sort of what were, if I'm going to create sort of the framework for the essential questions here, the big essential question is why the United States is getting involved in the domestic politics of Chile. Um, what I have put together is basically these documents here are also sort of mirrored on my website, and we'll post this website up to the Clax website. But um, I put together these are the themes that you guys could come in with, and these are some of the general questions. So these are the larger questions that my research provoked. Um, the first is sort of what these are big questions that you could apply to this this unit, but what were the U.S. foreign policy, economic interests in Latin America during the Cold War? Um, was the U.S. engaged in neocolonialism in Latin America? Uh, somebody brought up the Out of Many textbook. Um, in, in the Out of Many textbook, there's actually a, they talk about neocolonialism. During the Cold War, was the U.S. only trying to block Soviet communist expansion in the region? How did the U.S. view efforts to, towards economic nationalism or economic independence in Latin America during the Cold War or why? And again, these are gigantic questions. The more specific questions with regards to Chile, I, I lay out here, and we'll get to those in a minute. But as I was doing the research, I realized that it's sort of impossible to talk about the Latin America in the Cold War without going back a little bit further. And this morning, Professor Grandin talked about how, in some ways, Latin America works really well when you're looking at sort of the Cold War trajectory. It also, you start to see that there, these same patterns that we see post-45 also exist in the early parts of the 20th century as well, and actually going back to the 19th century. So um, what I thought that we could start, and I think it makes sense to start here in, in the classroom, if I were going to, I haven't taught this unit, but I, I'd like to teach this unit. And, and actually, I, I create a project here, which I'm planning to teach with my 12th graders, but I think that it could also work for 10th grade. Um, but if I were going to do it, I, I think that I would um, have to give some context, because I, I don't think that we could just sort of jump in with Chile 1970 and go from there. So what I want to hand out now is, are some quotes, and they're on the website too, and I'll show you where to find all these documents on the website in a sec, but these are some important documents, some excerpts, some quotes that I think sort of give a somewhat of a range of what U.S. thinking is with regards to Latin America, and, and the first quote goes back to 1904, so if you could take a look at this, um, and then I want to do something with this in a sec. So the first quote is, it's actually an excerpt from, uh, does everybody have? Okay, so the first quote is a, it's actually an excerpt from Roosevelt's speech. And um, what I have underneath there is, short activity you could do that you have the S here at the bottom which is summary reflection questions if we could just take a couple of minutes if you could read that summarize in one sentence what you're reading should be straightforward then reflect on what you're reading what does it make you think about what are your thoughts and then finally a couple of questions that it brings up and then maybe we can talk about it anybody have any reflections that they'd like to share or that they heard their partner talk about that you know, was pretty interesting to them yeah. Um, the 
few things. Uh, one is, I mean, if you go ahead to your topic, I mean, Henry Kissinger's got a quotation that's almost identical to you know, what he did. This is a fact that a lot of countries will come to to the irresponsibility of some people. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a challenge teaching the kids to analyze the words. Mm. You know, most of the time when they read through it, you know, they take, they take things literally. So they would interpret this as the United States saying, we'll only involve ourselves in countries when people are uncivilized or irresponsible, and not sort of go further with it, unless you kind of, even when we both teach advanced placement classes, even in advanced placement classes, you almost have to go line by line with them. To the kids, does this seem pretty reasonable after they do that? I mean, when they- Well, depends on how they interpret it, that's the problem. Yeah. Unless I put the image of Teddy Roosevelt with the police, mm. you know, with his uniform standing with this big stick, then maybe they'll start, you know, actually start using that picture. So it's really listed a certain kind of response and then take the language out. Some will, but not most. Anybody else have any thoughts about it? Well, you know, I was wondering to what extent this is still our policy today, mm. even under the current administration. I mean, I don't ask whether it was a push, because I think answer somewhat obvious to direct. But I mean, is it still sort of a guiding principle for us if you look at sort of what's going on in Egypt and how quickly, for example, you know, um, our president or secretary of state is actually speaking out against events in another country? And, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it is. And I think it's because our economic policy demands it more than anything else, more than politics. I think we, economically, I think uh, we need cheap labor. I mean, American businesses will, you know, push in whatever way possible to get that. I think it's important also, I mean, on one hand, it's interesting to see how these documents may lead to our current foreign policy in the 70s, you know, now or in the 70s, but I think it's also important to put the document in a historical context. I mean, from what I remember about this time period, a lot of these Latin American countries owed debts to European powers, and Roosevelt was afraid that if they didn't kind of maintain order and take control over the banks, then Germany or other countries would take over Venezuela or take over the Panama Canal, whatever it is, and that in that context, you know, all the European countries are carving up Africa, and Teddy Roosevelt is this ambitious guy. He didn't want to see America lose out in this like global race for colonies. Like in today's context, it's easy to condemn them. But I think it was like kind of like the zeitgeist. It was like the spirit of the time, and he didn't want to be a weak president and watch the world keep turning. And we stay this moral power. In the end, we're like a twelfth-rate power. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering about reading this alongside the Monroe Doctrine, and I was just thinking about in terms of assigning it to my own students, like how necessary or not necessary, but how helpful it is uh, to have read them. Monroe Doctrine or to sign it along with it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the problem when you're teaching any of this stuff. Because I, I really wanted to start in, this, in 1970. Then I realized, okay, we can't really tell the story. But again, then I should go back to 62. But you can't really tell the story of 62 without going back. Yes, and then you want to use, you want to go back to 1823. So, I, I mean, yeah, you can keep going back. And I, I totally agree with you about putting this in, in, in context. Um, the neat thing about this is that we start to see this language, as you said, come up over and over again throughout the 20th century and, and in the 19th century as well. Um, but yeah, I think it would probably be pretty helpful also use... It's dangerous because then, you, like you're saying, you can go back to the beginning but and I, not overwhelm Yeah, and, but that's actually, with every unit we do, it's the same problem. You could just keep going back indefinitely. Um, the next document I have, so this is one view of what sort of America's role in Latin America should be. And this is sort of the SRQ that I attached to it. This other one is much shorter, and it's, you guys are all probably pretty familiar with it, but you could also present, and this is a very different view in some ways, um, of what sort of U.S. foreign policy should be. And it's the Truman Doctrine, where he says it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or outside pressures. And again, this could be what's dictating uh, or, or framing uh, Kissinger and, and Nixon's foreign policy. It could be the Truman Doctrine. And you could do anything you want with it. You could draw, I have here, you could do a cartoon of, you know, of this. Um, then with the next document, it's again pretty familiar to us all. It's the containment document. 
uh, doctrine. And uh, here we have, uh, in these circumstances, it's clear that the main element of any U.S. policy towards the Soviet Union must be that of long-term, patient, but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies. So again, you have what could be an overlapping policy, but it, it's somewhat different, too. So you could look at another sort of, this is a, these are frameworks. Um, and then this is really interesting. It's also uh, a Kennan document. It's less well-known than the one we just saw. If you'll take a sec to look through this, it's, if you haven't seen it before, it's, it's pretty incredible. So this is the same guy who was framing um, sort of U.S. policy right after uh, the Second World War. And um, this is the, the policy that's not a, as famous. No, it's different. Same guy. So this is George Kennan. Any initial thoughts about this? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, I teach this. I've taught this before. And the kids all end up saying, well, I don't see what's so bad about this in some ways. I, I can't imagine that a country would do otherwise. And we get into lots of interesting conversations about this. Yeah. Mm. Mm. If, if we want to maintain that situation, this is what we have to do. Mm. And nobody questioned it at all. Yeah. You know, I think it's, it's documents like this that, that really lead to the sort of this age old question of morals and foreign policy, right? What are the role of, well, what is the, the role of morals and what's good and bad in foreign policy? Should that be an issue or should it not be? Should we take the Kennan or Kissinger view of things and just look at the world like a, like a chessboard? I think it, it really brings up this question, and, and I think that's a good one for high school students to, to try to tackle um, this notion of what's good and bad in, in, in American foreign policy. Yeah, sure. Yep. Yeah. Um, I just uh, this made me think that a good maybe thing to bring in to this discussion would be Obama's State of the Union mm -hmm. address because I was really struck by how, this, for some reason, people are, are don't. I mean, maybe they do realize it, but they're okay with it. The contradiction between our being this humanitarian like world police and also at the same time out competing everyone and you know winning the future whatever that means um, but I think it would, that could be an interesting thing um, to look at because the way it, it's a it's similar it's this weird contradiction between um, being you know the real politique and the moralism basically but um, it's interesting that e even someone like Obama you know uses that language while totally contradicting himself, and no one seems to notice. Yeah, it seems like the issue at the, at the Buddhist period was, you know, that either pre-Cold War or during Cold War or post-Cold War, it's like our values between the shark and the sardines, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the, the issue there is like, you know, unlike the Great Britain usually talk about themselves as an empire, proudly so. The oh. United States always had this kind of you know, ambivalence about it, but it seems like that's at the center, whether it's being defended because the, you know, the, the, the Germans might take the Panama Canal before there is communism to, to whether, you know, we have to get rid of Allende so there's not a red sandwich because of, of cash. You know, in other words, like, it, it raises the issue about whether or not the, the latest rationale of rhetoric is really just that and whether the larger issue is, despite all the democratic ideals at root, is there anything special about the United States in terms of world power or just like typical of any imperial uh, power except maybe, you know, prettier rhetoric. I mean, I think that's the fundamental issue. It's like yeah. uh, this sort of imperial relationship with the rest of the world. Yeah. I was sitting down to the very similar. So I would have had the first quote from Roosevelt Cor Corollary and just juxtaposed it to the you know, let's go to the chase, this is what I say, and, and uh, I'm using some uh, really words with some real racial overtones as civilized, non-civilized, as opposed to what. 
and looking at how daily mass is even in the world civilized, with the history we have of how we treated people within our own borders, Africans, Native Americans, you name it, uh, the Chinese who came over. So, um, so we start to have a civilized, and we're going to look at civilized the world. Yeah. That, that's almost laughable. But let's cut to the chase. What is he really saying? And so jumps to post and says, what, this is sifted down, and that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Stephen Carter also writes novels. He's, well, yeah, he's a great, he's the one who writes just mystery novels. Yeah. yeah. But he's really <laughs> his major, you know, his profession, yeah, professional, professional, yeah. so he's an international lawyer, which is that, I think what the uh, gentleman in the back said about the issue being imperialism is, is right off. And uh, what jumps out of here is, as teachers, I think we need to be asking our students that hard question do we want to continue to be a nation of imperialism or not? And I think what this is great, this would be great with contrast, this is like a macro like view of foreign policy, right? We're looking at, you know, but if you take it down to a micro view and look at the effect that these foreign policies have had, I think that'll give them a very good balance with how to make that decision. Do we want to continue to step on the backs of the bruise or strive for a society that is more egalitarian and more, uh, you know, equal along the lines of, you know, we're in a global society, yeah. not us wasting and, you know, just using the general of resources, but having a goal of sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I just, I think one of the things about teaching the Cold War that I find tricky with students is the way in which the rhetoric of the United States shifts so fluidly from economic terms to political terms during the Cold War. So it's <coughs> communism versus capitalism, and then it's communism versus democracy. And the kids get really confused by that, and it's difficult sometimes to tease that out because there are instances where it does look more like, you know, dictatorship versus democracy, and then there's other instances when it's just clearly sort of, you know, economics dressed up in that political language. And um, I think that these quotes help get at that um, confusion in some ways, but I can also see you would really have to pick it apart very carefully with yeah. students so that they can understand that, you know, Truman and Kennan are talking about the same thing, but using very different language. Yeah, I think that's true. And then, you know, with Allende, it gets even more complicated because he's elected and he's being called a red in the United States, but he's basically a European social democrat. And so you really have to get at all those terms and it's it's tough, yeah. I think it's also important because and even though what we've done in Latin America is like horrible obviously with Allende and all these, I think again, it's important to make it a debate and not like a moral lecturing. Like for example, when you talk about the Cold War, I think it's important also to talk about the Marshall Plan, mm -hmm. how we rebuilt Europe. Look at Japan and Germany today, you know, and what America did, the generosity, or the Berlin airlift, or if you're also going to talk about, imagine today uh, the Asia, the North Korea and China without a United States as like a benevolent kind of hegemon to like as a counterweight. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that Latin America, we were horrible. It's hard to defend that. But I think it's not just we're just as bad as any other empire. And I think cause if the kids just take all this that we did in El Salvador, what we did this, a lot of times they just come away from it thinking we're these horrible imperialists that killed Native Americans and blacks, and now we're doing it in Latin America and Iraq, and I think it paints a very distorted picture of our history. I think so too, and, and what I, when we get to the project, I'll try to show you that, I, I try to frame this as a debate. So I'll show you what the debate is and sort of why I started to think about this in terms of the debate. And it's actually, it is really complicated. I think you're right, it's not so clear cut, yeah. Yeah, I think that, the, I mean, sometimes people, when we're critical of U.S. policy, it sounds like we're being utopian, right? Because show the show us the country that doesn't do this, right? Or look out for its um, own national best interest. But I think what what makes this uh, so debatable is the way that it's dressed up um, mm -hmm. under the guise of human rights, democracy, um, and you know, 
regime change and democratization and, uh, you know, uh, altruism, right, which can and doesn't dress it up as. So I think that that's where the real debate comes in, and that's where America is maybe a little different from every other world power, superpower. Yeah, I and mean, what, what I'm trying to do here is so, okay, these are the, the standard reasons for why, or rationales why we get involved around the world. So the dominant theory, the statement theory, you can lay those out. You say, look, this is what you're going to read. And, and then there's the Kennan stuff where he's laying out containment. And behind the scenes, he's saying, look, it may be a little bit, we may not be altruistic at the end. But um, what I, the reason I got interested in this topic is actually it's not something I knew very much about. But I have a, a, a good friend whose grandfather was the U.S. ambassador to Chile right after uh, Nathaniel Davis leaves. So Davis leaves right at the beginning of 73. And the next ambassador is this guy, Popper. This is my, my friend's grandfather. My friend is he's a, a leftist guy, and he's struggled with the idea that his grandfather played a role in, in a lot of the sort of terrible stuff that, that happened after 73 with Pinochet. Um, and we were talking one night right at the beginning when I, was, when I got the fellowship, and I was trying to figure out what topic to do. And I, we started talking about his grandfather, and, and I was sort of asking him whether or not it was sort of how difficult it was um, to grapple with this stuff. And he said, look, the key thing as far as he was concerned is that the United States wanted the coup to happen, but ultimately wasn't responsible for the coup happening. And, and this is an important distinction, and it is going back to this idea of imperialism. It's the difference between imperialism and merely wishing something bad happens to someone you don't like. And so we didn't like Allende, but we didn't destabilize the regime. We tried. We were ineffective. And... This, I thought, okay, this is something I want to find out because we had a big argument about it. I went home that night, I stayed up late, and I started doing a bunch of research. And I was sure I was right the night that I was having the argument, and then the next morning, I wasn't so sure. And I thought, this could be a really interesting debate because it is so complicated. And what we find is that there's actually lots of documents out there, and, and the U.S. government's actually been trying for a long time to figure out what role we played. And so we actually have a lot of really neat stuff here. So what... What I've put up here is we have sort of, I'll walk through the documents with you on, online. You can look up here if you want, or you can look in your packet. But we have here something from the Washington Post, which, sort of, which you guys just read. Then this actually, these two documents come from the CIA itself. And the CIA website, I think in a really nice way, and of course they've got their own agenda, but in a really clear way, they can lay out what the U.S. did and what the U.S. didn't do. And you guys can see it's, it's here in your packets. But they, say, they, they take it sort of as a question-answer thing. So, so what role did the U.S. have in destabilizing the Chilean economy? Well, it's really interesting because the United States blocks lots of loans coming from the International Development Bank. At the same time, those loans are more than made up for by loans that they get from the Eastern Bloc, from Western Europe, and from Latin America. So actually, Allende increases the amount of debt that Chile has. He gets more loans than ever before. And so, and then the big question is, so the U.S. cuts off loans, but they make up for the loans. And the big question is, is it imperialism if you cut off loans? I mean, does everybody have the right to have loans from the World Bank? And if the United States says, no, we're no longer, we don't trust this government, we're not going to give you loans anymore, is this imperialism? I, it's a really complicated question. Were you, were you guys going to Yeah, and, and the United States plays a very big role in that. So, so I mean, you can have the kids find out on their own. You don't have to tell them that. The documents and the documents are all here, sort of laying out. So, the United States has forty percent of the votes in the International Development Bank, and you, there's one document. It's pretty short. The kids can look at that and say, "Wow, this is pretty." The U.S. is pulling the strings, and the U.S. is actually pretty explicit about that. Um, and even so, it may not make a big difference in terms of its ability to destabilize the Chilean economy. Um, in these documents here, if you guys flip to, say, page um, 19, you can see on page 19 that these are actually, this is a, a options paper given to Kissinger on the day of Allende's inauguration. And... Um, It's the, the first packet, the same one that you're looking at. On page 19, it says secret sensitive in the middle of the page. This option differs from the previous options. What we actually have is we have the United States in really clear language. It's only two pages, and the kids can easily use this, 
laying out sort of how we're going to destabilize the Chilean economy and exactly what we're going to do to make, quote unquote, the economy scream, which is what Nixon orders the U.S. government to carry out. Um, and it's pretty incredible. And, I th and again, it just goes on to the next page and you can see here it just goes, you know, A through D. And you can see here uh, sort of the import-export bank. You could do a couple of days just looking at what these banks do, what their role is in Latin America. So there's a ton of stuff here. Obviously, you could spend a semester on this. Um, and anyway, there's lots more pack, uh, documents like that. Um, what I want to show you now, though, is a quick clip from a film. Because this stuff is such an important question that there was a movie made a few years ago called The Trial of Henry Kissinger. So the, Christopher Hitchens wrote a book and then the movie was based on the book, but Christopher Hitchens wrote a book where he said, look, we ought to really put Kissinger up on trial for crimes against humanity, for war crimes. And in part, not only, but in part for what he does um, in, in Chile, what the United States does in Chile. So I want to show you a clip. This is just, it's a 10 minute clip uh, about sort of Kissinger's role in the actions the U.S. takes and then we'll get to the debate uh, or the project, which is the trial of Henry Kissinger. And so then I have prepared documents for the two councils, the Council for Allende and the Council for Kissinger. And actually, both sides have really strong cases. So it, it's, it's kind of neat. But we can start with this. I'm um, going to lower the lights. Henry Kissinger is a successful businessman. He a firm called Kissinger Associates in which he uses his diplomatic experience to help businesses around the world. But while Kissinger may profit from past connections, he is also haunted by them. Last year, Kissinger was enjoying a trip to Paris when a French judge served him with a subpoena to answer questions about U.S. involvement in Chile 30 years ago. That issue was Operation Condor, a campaign of murder and torture conducted by the regime of Augusto Pinochet. The arrest of Augusto Pinochet in London in October of 1998 directly led to pressure on the Clinton administration to declassify hundreds of thousands of documents, secret documents from the CIA, from the State Department and elsewhere, uh, blacked out as they are. These documents are really rather extraordinary. There's a paper trail right up to Kissinger's office that help us revisit this history and understand our efforts to overthrow covertly democratically elected government in Chile. I really think Chile was probably the basis and the most corrupt of all the actions because it had nothing to do with national security. Copper is used all over the world, but the largest known reserve of copper ore is in South America, in the Republic of Chile. In the 1960s, Chile was fertile soil for American corporate interests, including IT&T, which controlled the copper industry, and Pepsi-Cola. Early in 1970, Pepsi and IT&T were concerned about political developments in Chile. As the country's democratic presidential elections approached, a left-wing candidate named Salvador Allende was gaining popular support. His ties to Fidel Castro were a particular concern. He was the spokesman for Castro everywhere as part of his electoral platform. He had said he would not accept American aid. He had invaded against American capitalism, described the United States as not really being a democracy, but the Soviet Union was a democracy. Allende promised to nationalize Chile's copper industry, a direct threat to IT&T and concern to other U.S. corporations. I directed that an approach be made to both the State Department and Mr. Kissinger's office to tell them that we had grave concern of the outlook for ITT's investment. As IT&T called on Kissinger to take action against Allende, Pepsi President Donald Kendall echoed the same concern to an old friend, Richard Nixon. If he does it right in Chile, he's going to ensure a good flow of campaign money in 71 and 72. He's got a lot of big money people that want him to do something about Chile. So Chile became the most important national security item they had. What brought about the changes in Chile were well, the facts that it was being communized by LND. On September 4th, Allende won a plurality of the votes. It appeared certain that his victory would be confirmed by the Chilean Congress. The election in Chile has been won, but the president has not been confirmed, the new president, of Allende. Chile has, like the United States, a transition period of about 60 days. 
The CIA declared that Chile under Allende would not be a threat to the United States, but Nixon found the prospect of an Allende presidency unacceptable. As advisor to Richard Nixon, Kissinger followed Machiavelli's rule of flattering, adulating, and serving the powerful to be a success. In a September meeting, Kissinger shared his views on Chile's democratic election. I don't see why we need to stand by and watch a country go communist due to the irresponsibility of its people. On September 15, Nixon met in the Oval Office with Kissinger and Richard Helms, director of the CIA. Helms' handwritten notes reveal a plan to prevent Allende from coming to power. Not concerned risks involved. No involvement of the embassy. Ten million available, more if necessary. An internal CIA memo dated September 16th outlines the official but secret policy implemented by the CIA under the supervision of Henry Kissinger. Kissinger asked Helms to report directly to him on the details of coup operations, concealed from the Departments of State and Defense, as well as the U.S. Embassy in Chile. This plan for covert action became known as Track 2. Of course, that was a broad policy. I make no excuses for that. It should have been. Another Marxist regime in the hemisphere? No. In a meeting with Haig and others, Kissinger emphasized that drastic action was called for to shock the Chileans. Kissinger really became the general manager of this covert operation, representing the President of the United States. He ignored the advice of his own staff that a coup was not possible. I decided uh, to start sending these increasingly worrying alarms to Kissinger, that anything that might be tried would be an utter failure, the Chilean military was not going to uh, engage in anything, Allende was certainly going to be elected, nothing could stop it. Kissinger swept aside these objections and pressed the CIA to go forward to foment a military coup. But the third cable was the one that really excited uh, Kissinger because it said unequivocally that if any event were undertaken, it would boomerang against the United States and personally against the president, worse than the Bay of Pigs. That was the cable that they got me a summons home right away because they thought I had stumbled on their plot. So I flew to Washington, the president greeted me, he then launched into a denunciation of Allende. He kept hitting his hand like that. He was going to smash Allende economically. Kept referring to him as that bastard, that SOB. He was going to smash him. With the inauguration approaching, word of possible covert action against Allende reached General René Schneider, head of the Chilean military. Schneider announced he would uphold Allende's confirmation by the Chilean Congress. He was unaware that men from within his own ranks were being recruited by the CIA. Mi padre era una persona muy tierna, sí. Mi abuelo era una persona eh, que no mentía, que lo que decía lo cumplía. Y la ley significaba que, que la decisión de quién era presidente de Chile lo había tomado el Congreso. Esto obviamente a sectores no les gustó y comenzaron a, a atacar. The senior military officer, General René Schneider, is thought of as the principal obstacle to a military coup because he believes the Chilean armed forces take their oath only to the Constitution. In Santiago, the CIA helped design a plan to kidnap Schneider. They thought they would provoke the military into uh, declaring martial law, suspending the election. The CIA's Santiago station chief cabled Washington. General Schneider is the main barrier to all plans for the military to take over. Washington cabled back, constant pressure from the White House, more important than ever to remove him. It's therefore decided Schneider must go. And for this task, men of a proven record of criminal violence are recruited. They are given sophisticated assassination weaponry through the United States diplomatic bag. A track to CIA communique confirms this. The cable reports that plans against Schneider were moving along, requesting eight to ten tear gas grenades. 
three 45 caliber machine guns with 500 rounds ammo each. And they're given a uh, large financial inducement. The money was uh, gathered and uh, handled through uh, the CIA church channels. It's just back to what happened with me. No one sat on it while I was a hatching egg. You know, it was too hard to hold. In late September, Weimar, then U.S. military attaché, had been secretly assigned to work directly with the CIA in Santiago. An avid equestrian, Weimar's love of horses had made him a close associate of officers in the Chilean military, an ideal go-between. The CIA station gave Weimar a war chest of cash to pay out to anti aliandi groups. I couldn't put it in my office safe. Um, so I started, it was done in the uh, long rubber bands, 250,000. And uh, I put it in my riding boots and uh, no one else moved the boots but me. And that was the best place to just keep it. On October the 15th, Kissinger received word that Track 2 coup plotters had made a failed attempt to kidnap General Schneider. In a meeting with the CIA, he expressed his concern that plans for a coup at this time cannot succeed. In his memoirs, Kissinger would later write that he had turned off Track 2 at this meeting. But the very next day, the CIA sent a cable to Chile. It is firm and continuing policy that Allende be overthrown by a coup. It is imperative that these actions be implemented clandestinely and securely so that the United States government and American hand be well hidden. So on page 55, it's near the end of that first packet. The project is the trial of Henry Kissinger. All right, so if you're all there, we can skip the first part, which is just background. And the second part are the charges. And the charges are uh, essentially, there's two. The CIA sponsored a 73 coup against the democratically elected government of Allende, funding a reactionary military elements and helping draw up lists of over 20,000 people to be assassinated after the coup. More than 20,000 people are killed, but this is the CIA's role in it, is drawing up 20,000 people. And then we see here... Um, that Kissinger was an integral part of this, arguing for the coup. And then the next paragraph is that he's also being uh, charged with, a, with a, he's facing a lawsuit of $3 million for the death uh, of Schneider. Then if you skip down a little bit to uh, have the relevant international law, and if you skip down a little bit to the objectives of the project, uh, essentially what we'll have is we'll have three different teams. You have one team which is representing the Council for Allende, one team which is representing the Council for Kissinger, and then the third team, it can be sort of set up like the church committee. It's a Senate committee where you have senators in the class who are coming up with questions. Each senator can come up with three questions after they read all the relevant documents. And then what I've done is I lay out, um, so there's trial rules and again, pretty clear rules here on how long each team has to talk and so forth, and then the required reading. So maybe for the first night, uh, kids could watch part, you know, the 15 minutes that we watched uh, a little bit more of the video. Then they come in the next day and they read the article you guys read when you came in, the family of slain Chilean Suze Kissinger. Then the CIA uh, historical context and CIA activities in Chile. And then there's homework where you could watch the conversations with, Chile, with Allende, which I, I put together a link of videos, short videos, where actually we get to see Allende talking about what his policies are. So who is Allende? Why is he so scary? What does he say? Um, and then more documents, we break it up, and then day four and five, you break up the documents in the packet between the, the, the two councils and then the Senate committee, which reads parts of all of the documents. And that's essentially the end project. You could do this in a 12th grade class, if it's an advanced class, in a week or a little bit more, in a 10th grade class, two or three weeks. And obviously, there'd be some documents you'd want to use in the 10th grade class um, and others that you wouldn't use. I'm sorry, in the 12th grade class and others that you wouldn't use in the 10th grade. So that's basically that. Um, Does everyone read all the documents? No. Well, okay. So if, it, if I were going to do it, yeah, I would have actually both councils read all the documents and all the, sen the senators have to read all the documents. In some ways, the Senate has the easiest job because they just have to come up with questions. Um, but it's a lot of work to read all the documents. So you'd have to basically teach them power reading skills or they have one team 
skim the other uh, council's documents. Um, but yeah, I would, have them, I would have them read everything. And then here you have some films which you guys could watch part of. All these films are, are, are relevant. And then there's some shorter clips here, like the conversation with Allende. And I, I, I actually don't know how the Victor Jara stuff would come in, but it's interesting. And um, it could be fun to get into too, maybe after. He was a, a famous sort of folk singer in Chile who ends up being arrested at the day of the coup. And, they take him to a big stadium where they're holding prisoners and they cut off his hands and they tell him, they throw a guitar at him and tell him to play. Um, and there's sort of, I mean, the kids really kind of respond to the, those kind of stories. There's also a bunch of stuff in here. We have documents where they're talking to people who are working at factories and right after September 11th, uh, 19, uh, 1973, Pinochet's folks come into factories and they're looking for union leaders and they can't find the union leaders. They don't know who the union leaders are so they go to the secretaries, and this is sort of the policy. They find the secretary, they rape the secretaries, and then they find that the secretaries then tell them who the union leaders are. And we have the documents in here, and this is the kind of stuff that, you know, it's not just talking about sort of big U.S. foreign policy stuff, but it's the real stuff on the ground, and the kids have emotional, obviously, reactions to it. Yeah? Well, I mean, an idea is that you could do something on Nueva and look at Sabino Rodriguez and Victor Prada and the way the, this, you know, manifested in popular culture. Mm -hmm. And also his wife has written some stuff. I don't know. That's right. So that's another way you could. But yeah, kids are re respond really strongly to it. So. Yeah. And the music is also yeah. pretty great. Yeah. It kind of depends on which, which class you teach in yeah. there. But it seems to me, um, when I was thinking about the debate you said you had with your friend. Uh, and it seems to me important um, that if you want students to understand this, to not only see it as Allende versus the United States. Yeah. But in a certain sense, that's sort of the, a left-wing mirror image of kind of an American imperial view, right? Where yeah. it's just the president, and somehow all the people behind him are just sort of these nameless, passive things mm -hmm. and relationships with him. And because, you know, Chile is a fairly advanced industrial country. Yeah. And the labor movement really takes off after Allende's election. And by 72, there's you know really, really massive radical, that's why they're going after union leaders, because these unions were very radical, and they were actually illegally occupying and taking over factories and stuff like that. And there was really uh, an upper class in Chile that wanted Allende out, yep. and did not need to be told by Henry Kissinger to get rid of them. So it is complicated, and, and then so then you know you can ask, well, could they have succeeded without the help of the United States? And it's, it's sort of an impossible hypothetical. But the point is, I think to understand it as a as a real domestic conflict, a civil yeah. war that was in the making going on, and the United States intervenes in it yes. and tips the scale. But uh, but to not but I think it, I think it's problematic to teach Latin American history as just you know U.S. policy. Yeah, and I think what's that would be the argument that the that the Kissinger team would make. That the documents all kind of say, look, this ain't really developed economy. They've got uh, a class of folks who want to see the coup happen anyway. And the U.S. doesn't have to do a whole lot. So I think that it, it, you, you sort of see these two arguments play out in this, in this trial. One is that the U.S. is an imperialist force and so forth. And the other is, no, look, Chile is, is a developed democracy. Uh, the movie uh, Battle of Chile. Yeah. Has, you know, it was all shot in those years, 70 to 73 in Chile, and they've got That's right. a lot of this talent there. Okay. It's here, and actually, you can watch all of it on, on Google Video. So you could just show that, you don't need the DVD, um, you can show that in class, or parts of it in class. It's, it's long, three parts, but yeah, do that. Yeah. So, um, so I wanted to say one or two things, but, uh, you know, a parallel is in, I think it was 1952 or 54 in Iran. Um, there was this um, left wing, left leaning, um, uh, I think, prime minister elected in Mossadegh, and, and and the United States smuggles in a, just a couple hundred thousand dollars mm -hmm. to pay people to go out and protest against him, and he he comes down. And so, right, the question really is, is like, to what extent was the United States res really responsible for his downfall, or? Or what, what was it Iranian forces and we just kind of helped them? And then the second thing that I wanted to say is that this is all about accountability, right? Henry Kissinger is still sort of walking around. Was he really um, 
you know, held accountable was Pinochet himself. All the people that, that, that were the henchmen who, who carried out these atrocities for Pinochet. And, you know, and there's also the, this play, you know, Death and a Maiden, which deals with, you know, an individual torturer who was responsible for raping this woman and what should be done with the person who carries out these things. Well, the other thing is uh, relating to all these questions um, is that the I mean the documents are being released by the people who are releasing them, right? Mm -hmm. Not to sound like a total conspiracy theorist, but um, the role of the of various parties we won't know them necessarily because it's not in the self interest of of the people handing over the documents to release all of them, right? So we're always going to have a filter. I mean, and stuff is redacted, right? Stuff is redacted, yeah. Um, I think when you read the CIA stuff and stuff coming to the State Department, their analysis of it is, is skewed. I think the documents themselves are, are pretty good. And Cornbluth, the guy who uh, Granny talked about this right. morning, he's been really instrumental in getting these released through four. But I just, I'm saying I assume that there are more that we don't know about. Awesome. And yeah. the stuff that's redacted, so yeah. Sure. We always have to look at it with a grain of salt. So sometimes we get the sense that, okay, now everything's on the table and we know everything. Yeah. But of course there's more. Could be. Here, here, and then there. I think it's also an interesting conversation to have with the students that regardless of, even if there's a preponderance of evidence pointing to Kissinger did do this and he did do that, the bottom line is that it's never going to happen. You know what I'm saying? And you yeah. can talk about the fact that we are a huge, the most powerful empire in the world, and it kind of makes us immune to some degree, that like mm -hmm. leftist professors can hem and haw all they want, but in the final analysis, whether it's Ariel Sharon or Dick Cheney or Bush or none of these guys are ever going to stand trial. The only people who are going to stand trial in the ICC is going to be like Slobodan, some kind of weak, you know what I'm saying, guy who is no longer powerful, but those people I don't think are ever going to really face any trial because no one's powerful enough to kind of challenge the United States and, you know, I just don't think it's ever going to happen. I think that's an interesting question to think, to, to throw out to the kids, like how much of it is the fact that we're so powerful and it's, it's you know, because I mean, you could say the same thing with Cheney, right, or yeah. with the torture memos or the lying about getting into the war in Iraq. In the end, he's never going to be anywhere but, you know, some golf course. Nothing's going to happen to him. No, I think that you're right. I think that the neat thing, though, is that Kissinger is now restricting where he can travel. Right. Because he's afraid he'll be arrested. Right. So that's, you know, so depending on your perspective house. is that's, you know, positive. It's also chicken and egg, right? Not to sound too hippy-dippy utopian, but in theory, right, the part of the point maybe of education, um, and maybe I'm not jaded enough yet, but is to, you know, raise awareness and consciousness so that it's not that easy to, to convince people that it's okay that because you're powerful you get get out of, you know, literally jail free part. But, right. uh, yeah, you had a question. Yeah, I'm mean, going to do you what seems to me, but I'm just curious, having now studied this a lot, <laughs> what, what is your sense on, like, how far... Uh, Kissinger himself and the CIA went in tipping the scale. Yeah, I think that there's, there's two key moments. One is 1970, which is this period right between the September ele election and when has to vote on sort of which of the three candidates they're going to appoint. Um, then you have the Snyder death there. So what happens is that the U.S. really is, if this was, was the question for the trial, then it's pretty clear that the United States supplied weapons, they supplied money, and they really wanted this coup to happen. And they're probably... And, you know, if you're going to link Kissinger to what the CIA does, make him responsible for what the CIA does, then they're probably responsible for the death of Snyder. But, of course, the coup doesn't come off because this freaks everybody out in all the generals. And, you know, then I get, yeah, and again, it has three more years. Um, I think that there's a lot less, a lot less complicity in 1973. I think by September 1973, you have the trucker strike, which is going from July to September, which is essentially shutting down the whole Chilean economy. I think you have hyperinflation. I think a lot of this is stuff that's, again, internal. I don't think, um, I think there it'd be really hard to make the case that the United States is instrumental in the coup. Um, but of course, the United States is really happy when Pinochet comes to power and then we support Pinochet as much as we can. So I think that there's the two things. There's 70 and there's 73. And I think, you know, it sort of depends what you're looking at. Yeah, and then here. Look at how Kissinger and Nixon worked in in Chile, but also how they worked in Nigeria when the Africans were having their 
spectrum mm -hmm. and so um, do a little bit compare and contrast yeah. what would be um, special interest or like there and what what may have um, was, was there any bifurcation with where they were very similar and what may have been some of the impetus for the differences they said? Yeah, I think that'd be fantastic. And actually, it's in the video too. And you could do a whole week because we just watched five minutes of the video. But you could do a whole semester on the video, and you say, okay, here's the, the case that they lay out, and you could really get a sense of sort of the, the, the 1970s also global history in the 1970s through this video and you could say are so so you do a trial for each unit maybe and, and that could be one because that's that'd be fantastic so I think we just have time for one more so I think one of the things I tried to do is I'm finding that I'm, I'm getting less and less of it over the years while, mm -hmm. is that the kids don't have a strong sense of justice and don't recognize injustice mm -hmm. and they're very dismissive of these things, well, that's what powers do, that's what people do to sort of protect their interests, that's what everyone does. And that's the thing I'm trying to sort of, you know, you know, like being a bystander, whether you actually sort of intervene or whether you actually incite the situation, or whether you're a bystander, what's your role in all of this? And I'm, you know, you have this public relation line that we are the beacon on the hill and, you know, we are the light. And the, for the kids themselves to really be appalled at injustices. And that's what I'm, I'm getting this sort of sense that, well, that's what big powers do. That's what, you know, it's kind of like saying, well, in the context of the period, it was okay for Jefferson to own slaves. That's what people did back then. But not everyone thought that way back then either. So, in other words, that's, you try to get the kids to feel uh, stronger, whatever position. They have a strong uh, sense of, you know, morals and ethics and justice when what recognize injustice. You don't have to tell them to do it for them to for themselves to recognize that. A lot of kids are not doing that. I think it's, I, I, so I guess we gotta end. Yeah. Thanks.